And um, welcome everybody to the monthly HP Health Policy Special Interest Group uh, presentation in this particular case, discussion. And um, we're pleased to have Hassam Mahmoudi uh, here. And I, I, gonna, I asked him if he'd be willing to give us a little brief introduction to himself so people know who they're listening to. Take it away. Sure, thank you, Wayne. Um, I'm, I'm Hassam. Um, I'm a uh, PhD candidate here at uh, Virginia Tech in Management Systems Engineering. I work with uh, Dr. Navid Ghaffar Zadagan, and uh, I'm, I'm scheduled to finish my PhD sometime this summer, and I'm, I'm planning to join uh, MJ at MJ's lab at Harvard. So that's, yeah, that's the plan. Thank you. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about, about some research that I've been working on, and um, I have two disclaimers to start with. First, um, it's a, a work in progress. So of course there are lots of um, areas of improvement in this. Please feel free to um, um, you know, jump in whenever you have a question or have a suggestion. This is not a very formal presentation. So that's, that's one. Second is I would say it's at best a system dynamics adjacent research, um, but you know, thank you for, for listening and thank you. I look forward to the, the kind of uh, valuable feedback and, and the questions that you can provide. Um, so I'll be talking about um, organizational learning and endogenous heterogeneity in cancer research centers innovation. Um, so the, the, in this presentation, I'm going to briefly talk about the motivation for this research, touch on the uh, theory of organizational heterogeneity. I'll talk about clinical trials, uh, the process of new drugs and treatments going through clinical trials and its data and then present the research problem, um, a little bit of results and, and maybe some conclusions or some challenges that I'm facing with this. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so back in September, 2022, President Biden reignited, renewed the war on cancer or the battle to end cancer, um, the cancer moonshot. But as the word reignition suggests, this is not the first time we're doing this. It actually started in the Nixon administration more than 50 years ago, the war on cancer. So, and it's been reignited numerous times. And even after all this effort, cancer is still the second leading cause of death in the United States, around 2 million new cases, around 600,000 new deaths, uh, deaths every, every year. And that is why the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine um, called for a systemic approach to the problem in 2019. That's what we're trying somehow, somehow. Um, so the problem, the exact um, problem is that the return per investment per, per researcher, per, per paper, per patent of cancer research has been stagnating and falling in the past couple of decades. Um, and there's evidence that there are, there are differences among cancer research centers in, in the innovation strategies they adopt. Um, for example, this graph shows that publicly financed trials or research um, focuses more on, on a prevention and, and early stage cancer compared to privately financed trials, as in privately financed trials are myopic in that sense, they focus a lot more on late stage cancer. So we can see these, these differences, obvious differences between the, the approach towards, towards research. And the question that comes first is, um, these kinds of differences in, in innovation strategies are are there dynamics to it? Is, 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 um, you know, is there a dynamic phenomenon there? And second question that follows is, are they contributing to, to holding us back in our battle against cancer? Um, I'm gonna, as I mentioned, I'm gonna touch on, on uh, the theory and in, in, in the literature. I'm not I'm, I'm very good at this part. This is a, some, of the, some of the stuff that I've been learning through this project. So, um, there's, there's literature on, on um, heterogeneity in organizational uh, strategies. So in the classic economic theory, in that approach, um, justified heterogeneity, justified differences between strategies comes from exogenous factors. Uh, the, the, the view suggests that since all the agents are maximizing their, their utility, if two companies are deciding differently, um, taking different strategies, either that uh, they are in two geographically different locations, there are two different market sectors, for example, or at least one of them is making suboptimal decisions. Um, on the other end of this, the, the spectrum of these of, of the theories is the strategic management. Um, you know, that school of thought suggests that these actual deliberate and discretionary differences between companies 
are the drivers of excellence. That, that is why you can have one company outperform the other. And, and they are sometimes very much justified. That doesn't need to be um, an exogenous factor there. Um, the resource-based view of the firm, first of all, I believe sort of connects the two, the two ideas and gives birth to the idea of the dynamic uh, phenomenon causing heterogeneity. And that is uh, the, the suggestion that the company will choose the best choice for themselves, which is the one that is aligned with their capabilities that they've developed, what they've already invested in. And with that choice, they will invest more in that in that choice, and, and that will result in more accumulated capability that gives birth to, to specialization, essentially. And there are re re records in the literature of these kind of dynamics of heterogeneity in different um, fields, um, and I'm sort of adopting the capability development um, um, approach to, to this dynamics of, of heterogeneity. And there's, there's literature is, uh, uh, focuses a little bit uh, on, on whether or not these kind of heterogeneities are justified. And there's the suggestion that if, if there's high interdependence among, among the choices, or if there's uncertainty in the environment, or if there's needs for creativity and innovation, for example, then that heterogeneity can be justified. And a lot of these are, are what we expect to see in cancer research. For example. So focusing on the research question that I'm going to be talking and trying to address. So first question is whether or not cancer research centers are learning from success and failure. To, to diverge in their strategies. So this is the first dynamic phenomenon I will be trying to test. That is learning from success and failure, organizational learning. Second one is whether or not cancer research centers are developing uh, capabilities, accumulating capabilities and skills and, and knowledge, for example, to that, that helps them make them diverge and become different in, the, in this field. This is where I'm gonna talk a little bit about the clinical trials phases just to talk about the process of, of innovation in cancer research from discovery to development. Um, there are uh, literature, there's literature on, on a couple of dilemmas. I already talked about early versus late stage um, uh, dilemma. There is literature on, on follow-up versus breakthrough research dilemma in, in cancer research, but I'm, I'm focusing on a dilemma around the clinical trial phase. So just to, to recap the clinical trials and how they work. There is a pre-phase clinical trial, and that's where testing is happening on animals in vitro in a lab. Uh, there's phase zero clinical trial, which is uh, testing a drug for general safety, small doses of a drug or treatment to see if it's, it's safe for general public. Phase one focuses on uh, safety of the drug, but for, for the proper dose. Then phase two is the effectiveness, whether or not it actually does what it suggests that it's gonna do. Phase three is in comparison with, with already existing um, drugs and treatments. So if the, if the new drug or treatment cannot outperform already ex existing ones, it will not pass phase three. At the, at the end of phase three is where um, uh, this uh, innovation will receive then FDA approval ready for marketing. Um, and phase four is after something's been released in the market. And if someone wants to check for, for uh, additional side effects, um, that's where phase four uh, trials happen, and that lies outside the scope of my research. So I'm, I'll be focusing through the uh, for, on the path from pre-phase all the way to phase passing phase three and uh, uh, getting an FDA approval for for marketing. So the question here will be the dilemma will be uh, a company choosing to start uh, testing on a new drug or treatment, which will be down the line in pre-phase phase zero or phase one, or um, or pushing through a drug or treatment that has already passed those early phases, pushing it through phase two and phase three. And this is an investment um, decision to where to put their, their resources. And we're, we're going to be looking at that in terms of um, emphasis and exploration, how much a company or a cancer research center is emphasizing exploring for new drugs and treatments. And... Um, I guess this might be a good time to to stop and ask if, if there's any question. I feel like I'm talking and talking without any. <laughs> well, I've just been wondering, we always try to start pretty early in our explorations with a reference behavior pattern. You alluded to some of that, but mm -hmm. do you have a clear, what you would call, what do you, what are you kind of, what data empirical information is informing you about these dynamics? I, I know you started that conversation, but I just, I feel like I don't still have a clear sense for that. I will get to it, I think, in a couple of slides, but you're right. Maybe it's, it should have been earlier. Thank you. Thank you. 
So, so my, um, my question, I, I had a, sure. a brief question about the investment dilemma. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are you saying that uh, uh, you're going to abandon? It, it's a choice about whether or not to abandon something that's already in the pipeline? There is a choice, yes. You can you can have a drug that is past phase one or phase two, and you don't. if I don't see potential for it to go through the next phase, I will not invest in the trial. And trials are pretty expensive to recruit yep. and, and conduct. Okay, thanks. So talking exactly following that question, very good segue, uh, the pipeline of clinical trials. And this is um, this is a general, you know, aging chain, what, what pops in mind when someone talks about a drug or treatment going through the pipeline. I'm suggesting that this is not the case, as we just talked about. Something can be ab abandoned halfway through. This is not going to be the pipeline for this, for this uh, um, process. Rather, there are disruptions in this pipeline. And I'm going to get into details why there are these disruptions in the next slide. So um, the idea here is, is, first of all, we can have um, the same treatment exist in multiple stocks simultaneously here. And that means if I have a new drug or treatment that passed phase one, it will sit in the stock of phase one treatments past trials. And then I can start multiple phase two trials for the same drug as it's still sitting there. On, on different doses of it, different um, uh, conditions of different cancers. Uh, so th the same um, trial does not leave that stock to go to the next next phase uh, of the trials. That's why the pipeline is not a continuous one, but has disruptions. I hope that makes sense. Um, but that gives birth to the, to the uh, before, before going to the um, system dynamics model that I'm going to talk about, uh, talking about the reference modes or the trends over time, as we just, uh, as Wayne just pointed out, I just wanted to provide a little bit of data, and I will get into de details of where the data source is and how I'm, I'm using it. But as you can see, following the fact that there can be multiple phase two trials on the same phase one trial, as you can see, there's a lot more phase two trials than phase one or pre-phase trials totally conducted on the left-hand side. And then... Just looking at the trends, you can see that there is an uptick in pre-phase, phase one, and phase two trials um, in the past 20, 20, 30 years. But the phase three trials, which is essentially if it passes phase three, it will be an FDA approved drug out for consumption and hopefully improving people's lives. That's been stagnant, even though the, the other three have been going up. That can be a case of a case of a delay or it can be some, some other mechanism. And that's what we're trying to look at, hopefully in the bigger picture, not in this research, in the big, bigger picture. Is it possible that, that the reason for this is because as you proceed in time, you're starting to accumulate more and more successful treatments and now beating the marker gets harder and harder, I would yes. think. So, so I would say that what you mentioned there, Two, two aspects to it. One of them is the natural saturation of technology. That is, you know, so there might be a limit when there's a chance that we can cannot go any further than that. And the second one, as you mentioned, is that that, that uh, structure of phase three trials, that you will only pass phase three trials if you're outperforming already existing ones in some aspect. So that's, that's a threshold that is increasing little by little all the way through the time. And that can be a, a part of it without a doubt. Um, but the, these two that we just talked about are, are the two dynamic mechanisms that I don't think we can do anything about or, or we can't do much about. So the question that we are trying to ask and answer is, are there dynamic mechanisms that we can, we can improve upon? You know what I mean? So uh, I have a question. Uh, oh, um, yeah. So for the pre-phase, so I guess I'm thinking about sort of real innovations that like completely yes. change the way we think about something right i mean so if we're if we're talking about like are, are you able to build in and see what happens with the dynamics when a whole new way of thinking about something comes into play um i'm i'm not sure if i got your question uh, completely but i just want to point out one thing and that is the beauty of these clinical trials data is that there can be there can't be any research outside these. So even if a cancer research center comes up with an idea, they still have to go in and then it's a like brand new idea out of nowhere. Still have to go in and test it. And a lot of times that that testing is a is part of the process of coming up with the idea too. 
and that that what that does is is except for preface, which there is no mandate for reporting it. Um, the other ones, there is a mandate for reporting. So looking at uh, the other phases, we know exactly what and where the cancer research community is, is spending uh, time and focus on in terms of research. And the pre-phase is, not, I don't think there's a mandate, uh, but it's been a very common trend in the past two, 20, 30 years. So I was presenting this research to Dr. Hajir, um, Hajir Rahman Dodd recently, and he pointed out that that uptick in the pre-phase here can be partially caused by that change of culture um, because there's no mandate in reporting it. And that is that is potentially one of the contributors. Was there another question? No, I mean, hello, hi, uh, Hasim, sorry. Uh, just to add, actually, I, uh, I, I'm just thinking that uh, since uh, I am a, I'm from a pu public health, so phase three, what uh, is actually uh, referred at for which it, this involves a, a lot of patients. Yes. Uh, so compared to phase one and phase two, because it's the stage actually where we go for safety and efficacy, as well as the novelty of the uh, effectiveness, the novelty. That's the uh, term. So I'm just thinking that perhaps uh, since it uh, requires a lot of logistics and other uh, resources, and that uh, might be the kind of explanation for uh, less amount of investment or uh, this. You, you, you're right. So what, what you're pointing to is that the, the uh, cost, general cost, not only dollar cost, but general cost of running these different kinds of... Uh, um, of uh, phases of trials are not the same, and, and you're 100% right. However, it's good to point that the, the reward for the Cancer Research Center, which is the FDA-approved um, 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 treatment, it sits right at the end of phase three. So I understand that it's it's costly, but if it's promising, I believe the, the Cancer Research Center that has resources can look into it. Again, I'm, I'm not trying to look into the single story of, of each one drug where it's sitting, but as a whole trend. And that what you're suggesting as in maybe like um, insufficient funding or resources for, for phase three trials, that can be a contributor, but that is again, a, a static explanation. I'm trying to look at if there is any dynamic explanation of the problem. We still don't know. Is there data on the success rates over time of phase three clinical trials? That would seem to be an interesting part of this story. So right. the clinical trials data, as I will get to it, does not report explicit success and failure. I've, I've put together something as a report of success and failure, and I'm working as a second measure on something else. I will get to that briefly. Thank you. So going back to presentation. Um, so what I'm what I'm going to do in this in this research is I'm I'm pulling together three phase and phase one, phase zero, there are no phase zeros reported ever in cancer research. So I'm, I'm putting that outside. Pre-phase and phase zero research together. And I will call that exploratory research. And, and phase two and phase three, pulling them together and calling them uh, FDA research or market ready research. Um, the reason I'm doing this is I'm trying to, to form that dilemma of choice. And in nature, as we just talking about that, the, these these uh, uh, two groups of, of trials are, are different in the sense that pre-phase and phase one requires public recruitment, smaller number, as we just talked about, but but not patient recruitment, where phase two and phase three require patient recruitment. And then um, the resources for phase two and phase three for a cancer research center usually comes from, from promises of a, of a drug or treatment being marketed eventually, but the resources for pre-phase and phase one, a lot of times comes from pure exploration, national grants, funding, that kind of stuff. So these two, these two groups of trials are in essence somehow different. And, and um, um, we're pulling them together to, to focus on that dilemma. Taking a look at the data on, on, on these two um, and these different four phases, um, if we classify the, the different cancer research centers into, into these very crude uh, classifications that I have here, what is, what is obvious is um, there's a lot more rise and, and net pre-phase happening in hospitals and clinics and in universities compared to, for example, private companies. And private companies are, are focusing a lot more on, on phase three 
uh, in comparison with with universities and, and hospitals, for example. And and that is again one of those exogenous factors that we would expect to see. Um, but but it shows that there is heterogeneity. There are differences in this emphasis on the explorative trials, explorative research. Moving along to the system dynamics model. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm grouping together phase zero and phase one, calling them exploratory research, and then um, and then pulling together phase two and phase three as in FDA um, research, um, markets ready research. So putting together that that uh, system dynamics model and this this um, orange link in the middle is that is that disruption which connects the the pool of exploratory treatments past trials to the to the new ones in in the FDA to the initiation of FDA trials. But this on the spot reminds me of the of the dynamic capability operational capability model from Rahman 2012. It it does have the the um, uh, division of the resources on, on the two different kinds of trials. And the efficiency of FDA trials depends on the number and quality of, of the exploratory treatments that I have at my disposal that I've already passed the early phases of trials. And, and um, upon, upon this, this um, um, operational capability and dynamic capability model, I'm adding a few, a few things. First, I'm adding the um, accumulation of capability in each type of research. So the hypothesis here is, as the Cancer Research Center is, is investing in exploratory trials, we'll acquire the skills to, to acquire fundings from, from NIH, for example. It will accumulate the know-how to, to do public recruitment and to run phase zero and phase one trials, for example. And that becomes the exploration capabilities that it's accumulating. At the same time, another cancer research center, which is focusing on, on FDA trials, will acquire the, the capabilities for, for FDA trials required for that. So they will become specialized, essentially, in that, more expert in that specific kind of trials. And what we're trying to see is the emphasis on exploration here, or, or in, in thing, the, the fraction to, to dynamic capability in, in Dr. Ramondot's research. Is that endogenous? What I'm trying to do is try to endogenize and see whether or not the cancer research centers are being affected by their success and failure and by their accumulation of, of capabilities to, to change their emphasis on exploration. That is the whole goal of, of this research. I think I took 20 something minutes to get here. Um, <laughs> um, yes, and, and um, to, to look at it as, as the two pieces, like dynamic capability and operational capability, I, I think I first use the same terms and um, uh, Navid pointed out that that's not necessarily the correct term here. So I've, I've chosen the long-term investment and short-term investment into cancer research, as in the FDA um, research will, will is, is closer to resulting in, in outcomes for cancer research, but if, if the market as a whole, or if a cancer research center itself ignores investing in the long-term investment or in the dynamic capability of this of this world, then there will uh, their their stock of exploratory treatment past trials will run dry eventually, and then doesn't matter how much investment they're putting in the FDA trials, will they will not have good candidates to go through this. And this is where I'm leaving system dynamics in this research essentially. So going through the definitions of of what we have um, in this research. Um, 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 the dependent variable or the em emphasis on exploration, um, it's the percentage of trials. We've defined it as the percentage of trials a cancer research center starts, initiates in a year that are exploited. So if it's 10 trials they've started and six of them are phase zero and phase one, then that's like 60% emphasis on exploration. Then. The success and failure rates, as Wayne was inquiring about, comes from um, there are 11 outcomes for a, for a clinical trial reported in the clinical trials data. And we categorize them into either um, um, a failure, which is if it's withdrawn, terminated for, for side effects, for example, or I haven't been able to recruit, um, ran out of money. These are all the cases that we would, would call them a failure of a clinical trial. And then some of them are ongoing, still recruiting, 
So we have some that are still ongoing at the time. And then some of them have, have completed. Now, we're aware that those who have completed, finished the trials, that does not necessarily mean that that was a success in the sense that it doesn't necessarily mean that the drug or treatment did what it was supposed to do. But it's a success in terms of, uh, of the process of clinical trials. So they, the Cancer Research Center was successful in finishing the clinical trials. And then what we, what we expect to see is that if this just completion of a trial affects the decision later on, then this is just dampened effect compared to the actual success of a trial. So if we can find significance that just the completion of a trial has, has affected the, the strategy, um, the, the actual success should, we're expected to, to see that has, has the same kind of effect. And then we are, we are looking at the accumulation of the last three years of explorative trials initiated as accumulated capabilities. And we've tried a, multiple different um, combinations of, of uh, um, this measure of capability. And I can show you the, day, the results on that to, to say why we go with the three. I, don't ha still ha I still don't have a systematic way of, of defining this measure, coming up with this measure. But again, the hypothesis goes as the research center will decide that between exploratory trials and FDA trials, we'll, we'll see some success and failure in each one of those trials. So one of the hypotheses we're testing is that does that success and failure affect their, their emphasis on exploration? The other hypothesis is that as they're making that the decisions between the exploratory and FDA trials, they're accumulating capabilities and whether or not that accumulated capabilities are, are affecting the, the emphasis on exploration. And uh, we don't know whether or not the success rate or failure rate of, uh, is affected by that accumulated capabilities too. Um, so there are the three things that we're gonna be looking at. And of course, we have some exogenous factors which comes from the literature, the size of a company, the type of the research center that can be affecting these the dependent brands. Is there any questions at this point? I've been wondering about feedback loops. They're <laughs> implied here, they're here. What did you find or have you found value in looking closely at the actual feedback loops and their kind of interplay with each other, as opposed to relying more on quantifying the equations and all that sort of stuff? I just wonder, does that sort of potentially very useful qualitative part of system dynamics, does, does it have the, has it or ha, for you, is it added value or is it? So my question is um, um, regarding that point. My question is, are you talking about the feedback loops that close in when we endogenize the emphasis on exploration it, well, or, well, or sure, other but, feedback loops. But, there, but they're interplaying with a lot of other feedback loops or maybe potentially this process doesn't look feedback rich. Actually. Rich, true. And so it might mean that building this feedback loop in more directly could have more of a profound effect. Maybe I, that's what I just wondered, you know, as the, it's the teacher in me that wants to make sure you talk about feedback loops, you know, great, so just... great point. So if I go back to the um, uh, dynamic and operational capability model, the feedback loop there closes when um, Azure points that the outcome of this process. So here, the, how many FDA treatments pass trials is where you get to market to those drugs and treatments, and that will endogenize the endogenize the total resources that is at disposal. So the resources that this firm will, this cancer research center will, will experience as a big part of it coming from, from you know, marketing and selling the, the end products. So that's one of the feedback loops that is, is posed in that, in that um, uh, model. But I think that that paper stays out of, of endogenizing the, the emphasis or the, the preference between the two, but, it, but rather tries to find where the optimal uh, value of that emphasis is when we know that there's the resources are endogenous. So in, in contrast with that paper, I'm trying to look at the, the endogenizing the emphasis, but of course the resources are, are, are endogenous too, without a doubt. And even, even resources coming from national grants, which do not directly depend on, on the sales of the end product, that is dependent on, on some of the outcomes, previous outcomes or, or the capabilities. So that is, again, another feedback loop that can be closed there. But yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. So let me go through these. So I'm just gonna 
mentioned that there are two main hypotheses. One of them is the learning from success and failure. The other one is the uh, effect of accumulation of, of uh, capabilities that we would like to look at in the data. Let's get to the data, and I want to leave some, some good time in the end for discussion. Um, so we have this um, extensive data from clinical trials uh, publicly available, uh, more than 108,000 trials. Um, it takes, it takes uh, our, our hardware quite a long time to turn that into a firm year data rather than a clinical trial data. Um, and then we, we, we have a code that reaches out to, to companies, Cancer Research Center's Wikipedia page, uh, and sometimes their websites to, to collect some characteristics on them. This is an ongoing effort now, so it's not perfectly done, but that's that's what, what we're doing in terms of exogenous factors of the Cancer Research Center. And then we have the NASH NIH annual funding on cancer as a control variable to see if you know that's affecting the, the process. And, and looking at the trends of of the dependent variable, the emphasis and exploration through time. Um, after turning the trials data into a firm year data and cleaning up the data, um, as you can see, even though there is data available since 1971, um, there aren't that many meaningful trends anywhere past 1990 in the data. So the majority of data starts at 1990. The, uh, the rising trend is similar in different types. So if we have companies or universities, for example, it's, they're close, but um, the levels are different. So companies seem to be stabilizing uh, lower than universities, which is in green. And um, I think that's all I have to say on that. So let's take a look at the first set of results here. Um, and this is a lot of numbers and I have a lot more numbers that I'm not planning to show, of course, but uh, what we can see here is that there is learning from past, a specifically success rate of explorative trials seem to be uh, um, causing um, more exploratory behavior and, um, and the uh, capabilities, the accumulated capabilities seem to like uh, suggest that if we have a cancer research center, which has been engaging in more exploration, they tend to go further into exploration. And those which have been engaging in more FDA trials seem to be trending towards more FDA trials, as in less emphasis on exploration. So this is the suggestion that there is there is the capabilities are, are causing, accumulation of capabilities are causing divergence and endogenous specialization in the markets. As for the exogenous factors or control variables, um, looks like size, um, is, is significant as in bigger cancer research centers are engaging in less explorative, a little bit less. And uh, the trend is towards more exploration, trend of time, um, more funding results in more exploration. And, and among the different types, uh, university and hospitals have um, the most tendency towards exploration. Um, I think I have a few more of these tables and I don't want to go through all of them. Essentially, um, this, is, this is just checking the uh, outcomes, sensitivity of the outcomes to, to um, um, year fixed effects does not affect the, the findings in general. Um, uh, this is um, expanding the data set to, um, and this doesn't affect the, the, the the outcomes in general. I didn't get into the cleaning of the data a lot, but that's that's what lies behind it. Well, unfortunately, the firm fixed effects uh, affects the findings a lot. And what this suggests to me is that there are more um, across firm variations in the data than within firm variations. That can be caused by two, two three different things. One of them is that um, um, we have only 30 years even for the biggest um, firms, for some of the cancer research centers, we have maybe like five years, six years of data in sequence because they're newer, newer uh, centers. Mm, we don't have that much time for the dynamics to show themselves. And our, our exogenous factors, the characteristics we're reading from Wikipedia and, and websites is not uh, properly done yet. So it's still room for, for improvement there. So there might be some missing uh, exogenous factors, uh, characteristics of firms that can be controlled for and 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 address this problem. Hopefully, 
But what what is what stands out is that there is a little bit of um, significance still remains even with the uh, um, firm fixed effects uh, sensitivity for for uh, experiential learning. But the the uh, capability development hypothesis persists through all, all the different types of pretty much persists different types of sensitivity analysis. And uh, this is about the length of the theory. I'm just going to skip these because it's way too much and way too detailed. Go to the conclusions. Um, so what, what we witnessed from the data is that there is differences, differences in trends in, in emphasis and exploration. Um, the exogenous factors that the literature suggests do play a role, but there is some evidence in experiential learning's effect. Specifically, successful exploratory research seems to be affecting um, um, promoting more exploratory research. But the capability development uh, hypothesis is, is a staple. We have findings for it, which is pretty stable, suggests that the, the companies, the research centers are becoming specialized either in, in uh, exploration or, or FDA research, and they're they are diverging in time. Um, these are the challenges that I'm going to be facing. I'll, I'll be working to update my cancer research center characteristics. It's uh, looking into that. I don't have a perfect method of finding the length of the memory, or how how many lagged um, uh, independent variables I have to include in the in the model, and eventually this is this is where it goes back to the system dynamics model. Eventually, when we can find evidence that that emphasis on exploration is endogenous in the sense that is affected by accumulation of capability or by success and failure, I, I hope to bring this back to the system dynamics model, and then and then. That's where, where I can potentially look to different styles of resource allocation, as for example, the social benefactor, which is NIH or NCI, how can they um, um, allocate resources to, to get better results when we appreciate the fact that that, that tendency towards exploration, emphasis on exploration is actually endogenous. Thank you for listening and sorry for dragging on. Well, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. And I appreciate there's sort of a, a very fast look through the data, but this always is a reminder for me that 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 what we do isn't just playing with models. We have to deal with the real world data, and that that's that's terrific. About that data, I think what you were showing it went that pie me pretty fast. Those were correlation coefficients that you were showing. Um, or, or was, I, I what think you, these are all regression results. Okay, so they're betas. Yes, they're they're loadings on on particular uh, uh, independent factors. Yes, and then uh, were you showing in the parentheses something about p values or something? I just was wondering. Yeah, so um, essentially, real clear. yeah, this, <laughs> I see your point. Um, um, the the thing is about these these kind of tables. They they even even. Um, you know, it can get very boring to talk about all these details of the data. So I tend to stay away from them and just point to what I understand from them. And, <laughs> and these are there for anyone else who wants to look at them. But the idea is, yes, these are the betas and the parentheses is the standard, uh, standard error. And then, you know, we have all the ones that are significant. For example, in this specific um, regression, which we're trying to see what is contributing to success and failure, not to, so this is endogenizing the success and failure rate, essentially. This suggests that that our university hospitals experience less, less um, um, success. And everything's yeah. been normalized. That's so, why we see numbers between zero. A lot of it has been normalized. Some of them are logged and, and you know, depending on, on the on the variable yes well, i would so the say numbers just, don't mean much yeah but the significance for, means yes but for future representations i think most of us need you to kind of give us this little overview you did just now so that we kind Point of and then we appreciate you dialing into what we should be looking for but for me it was sort of a sea of stuff and i think you could have i'm just that's just intended this is intended as a friendly suggestion <laughs> Point well taken. You're right. And I honestly don't know. I come from a system dynamics background, and I think this <laughs> might be the first work. I don't have any system dynamics results to present, but, you know, I just honestly don't know what's the best way to go around this. Go about this. Okay. Well, that that's why we do these these talks in this friendly environment. So we mm -hmm. can, if you go take this into the conference and present it there, maybe, maybe it will be a little bit uh, strengthened by having practiced. Well, 
we hope. I'm less painful. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to say, I, I think it's fantastic that you presented us with these regression results. And, uh, and, and I think uh, they're going to really support your modeling work um, tremendously in your, your you know, efforts to quantify. Uh, it, I, I just had a very basic question. I, I think I missed the difference between the experiential effect, the difference between experiential and capability. I think the capability was, the experiential was success versus failure and the capability ignores success versus failure, something like that. So Could you go over that again? Sure, definitely. And that's a really good question. I think um, so that's one of the, the stuff that I'm very passionate about, actually. And the idea behind that is, is these, these um, research centers are, are um, learning what to do and learning how to do it at the same time. And I, I'm really, that's maybe the focus of my, my research interest is, is looking at different scenarios that, that an individual learning or an agent learning is learning these two simultaneously. And that creates a dynamics. So the, the, the experiential learning, learning from experience is learning what to do. So it's if I invest into exploration and it's unsuccessful, I will go towards less exploration in the future. But at the same time, we tend to learn how to do it. So we're, we're accumulating capabilities for, for running explorative research or FDA research as we're practicing it. So that combination of becoming a specialized or expert in one or another, at the same time that I'm getting feedback from success and failure and, and moving towards this, moving that needle where to go, that that causes this, this emphasis and exploration dynamics. So, so I, I think I was right in understanding that capability, and I see it here in the diagram, is is not affected by success and failure. It's just an accumulation of, of experience what we practice. from having done it. Yes, it's what we practice and become skillful in rather than know what to do. It's the how to. And, and for your regressions, the definition of experiential on the other hand, was about a success rate. Yes, it, learning from experience, yeah. yeah. As in success okay, or good. failure. I, I, I think this is terrific work. I really like it. Thank you. I I also really like um, the those two ideas that you're playing with. Um, I think it's really, really interesting. My question was, um, do you see the, the just take uh, university hospitals, for example, do you see them growing over time as they get more experience and greater um, capability? Because I know at Pitt, um, uh, success begets growth, right? We bring in more faculty and, and we expand yes. the number of trials that we're taking on because we have more faculty. So what, what you're suggesting is to, to see if the data uh, points to to growth of the size of the operation based on success or capabilities. That's something I haven't looked into, and that's something very interesting that I will look into. Thank you. Thank you for that really interesting suggestion. What I'm wondering about Hi. is... Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Please. Please. Wendy, is fine. Go ahead. I will come later. It's fine. I was just gonna gonna ask if for for various purposes you might want to come up with how can I make these points, you know, uh, more potently, more powerfully, you know, it might, some of it might be to take and create simpler stylized models with less detail, but that help you make the key points like what Jack was talking about. I know Jack's actually really good at this. He's really good at taking a complex model and creating a much simpler version that he can use to explain it. Uh, and and there might be an opportunity for something like that for you, for certain particular audiences, maybe not a technical audience, but some audiences, you know. So, so my goal, and that's a really good point, um, and my, my goal in, in, in my research was to um, uh, exactly follow up this work with a smaller stylized model and, you know, try to simulate all aspects of that to understand how the mechanisms work and then if eventually the, the follow-up step would be to build a little bit of a um, more expanded model or something like this and then you know feed in the data and, and see where where that model and data together come together um, unfortunately my my phd is coming to an end before i ever stepped into those so uh 
after my postdoc, maybe I'll, I'll follow up on that and hopefully present whatever I find. Will you be able to continue this work at Harvard? Um, I don't think so. No, I'll, I'll be working on, on something else, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I will come back to this eventually. It'd be great. I think it's really elegant and, and deserves mm -hmm. to be. Thank you very much. Although, can I, um, uh, uh, so many things to ask about this, but um, I, I was I, I was a few minutes late in the meeting, I apologize. <laughs> so I, I was interested to know um, the extent to which you're, you're relying on uh, published data, the extent you're having conversations with people who are involved in the different types of research. Uh, oh. and, and how, because I'd, I'd be interested to know what what, um, what the scientists themselves perceive to be the, the issues about the balance between exploratory and, and FDA work. For, for example, um, you were you were saying you were saying that um, the the more exploratory work we do, the more likely we would have an emphasis on exploration. So. So exploration leads to more exploration, and and um, does that you could you could overemphasize exploration to the point where you, you have so much FDA work. So, um, so yeah. So I'm just interested to know what what the views of, of, of the actual practitioners are about what you're doing and and how it helps to clarify how they develop. Um, that, that, that's really the question. Thank you. Thank you for that great point. Um, I wanted to point out two things in, in response to what, what you just mentioned, Douglas. First is uh, you're 100% right. I, I haven't um, gone through that, that process of talking to the experts. I believe that can be a very interesting um, endeavor to, to, to run that kind of interviews um, and, and then you know bring them back maybe into a causal loop diagram of, of the process or, or a better understanding of the process. And, and um, unfortunately, that's not been something that I've worked on. I want to point out what you talked about, the fact that yes, exploration results in maybe a little more exploration, but there, there will be a limit to it uh, mm -hmm. as, as any exponential growth has that limit. There's, there's this, there's this uh, mechanism here, which is you know, in the, in the capa operational capability, dynamic capability, there isn't any chance of outsourcing one or the other for a firm. But here in the market, a cancer research center can actually, if they haven't invested enough on exploration, they can actually go out there and buy the patent of some new drugs in the process, midway through the process from universities, for example. So this, this link that connects the two different exploration and FDA, that can be sort of a, there's a market there and that can be, can be um, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, outsourced. And that, that results in, in a less necessity for, for ambidexterity among these compared to the operational um, dynamic capability world. Um, so what, what you're talking about is, is that dynamic definitely exists, but that's usually addressed in the, in the market by, by outsourcing that part, as far as I know, at least. But again, it's better to ask the, the experts there. That's it. Yeah, thank you. So I have a question about who are the PIs who are doing the phase zero one and the two three. Um, I'm sort of imagining that the zero one people have their expertise at the zero one level and the two three people have their expertise at the two three level, right? And they're not the same people. Well, th that is that is the hypothesis at least. That's what we've, we've assumed that, that, you know, the, the people who run uh, zero ones have the expertise and, and capabilities and skills of that and, and the other way around. The interesting thing is that the, the clinical trials data actually includes both the name of the of the um, research center and the name of the PI. So if I if I intend to eventually look into into that by by any means, that is a possibility, it needs a lot more work with the data. And and I think it it limits our scope to um, to bigger bigger uh, research centers that, that mm -hmm. actually have that kind of division. So I just want to make one brief cl uh, clarification about the data, and that is I mentioned that there are um, 
7,800 um, research centers in the data set, for example. I can find that. Um, yes, but 7,300 data um, research centers, data set. But the majority of these research centers do not maintain a flow of, of filing a, a uh, trial this year and followed by another. A lot of them are one time, one hit wonders in that sense. So what happens is that when I want to look at, at that, that learning from experience, the data set essentially effectively comes shrinks down to around 400 firms. Yeah. The biggest 400 cancer research, research centers, which covers somewhere around 40% of all trials because they're, they're the largest. Mm -hmm. You know, but but you know the data shrinks. So if I want to step, make that one further step towards you know including you know that relationship between PI and and um, the research center and the differences there, data will shrink again, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Makes it more manageable. But but you know an interesting follow. Yeah, yeah, and I uh, I agree. But I think that your question is fundamentally a question of those larger centers and not the one hit wonders, right? right. Um, and I guess what I'm thinking about is if there is this specialization in expertise in, in that translational pipeline, um, I'm imagining that you've got your, your basic scientists, right? Who are figuring out these new things um, and they need colleagues who can help uh, translate it and do those translational studies. Um, and I wonder if they're putting each other on as co-eyes um, for any kind of, I, I think sometimes that happens. I think a lot of times it doesn't. Um, as, as an implementation scientist, I know, you know, it's great when I get pulled in early, but that doesn't happen most of the time. Um, and that I'm seen as a separate thing from the people who are coming up with the innovations. So what, what you're pointing to is essentially if these two kinds of, of cancer research centers are, are diverging and become specialized, how, how far uh, away from each other is it, is it beneficial for them to specialize away from each other? Because there is definitely some benefit in their communication and collaboration. You know, so there are two different forces. The specialization uh, force, which is, you know, if you become more more expert, it's better to focus on this, pulls them apart, and that need for collaboration pulls them together. And that will be interesting to see eventually if that is evidence for that, or, or even the stylized model of it. I'd love to see that sometime. I, I mean, Taba, go ahead. Yes. yes. I was going to invite you to please speak. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Hi, Hasim. It's a really, very interesting work and engaging also, I must say. I uh, have a question about you, while well, you are arguing that uh, there is uh, endogenous heterogeneity now, yes. and this is uh, primarily linked to the firm's own or organization's own capacity uh, in uh, or engagement with scientific progress or uh, activities. Now, I'm just thinking that um in the concept at the conceptual level how far your model ha has interacted with the say, subsystems of financing because mm -hmm. this actually heterogeneity of firms in say uh, uh, say firms economies or organization economics it is leading to oligopoly or market oligopoly always. And in this uh, access to medicine or this discourse in public health. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is a known fact is that say like there are 20 to 22 uh, pharmaceutical companies which uh, have most of the share in, in market as well as which uh, also uh, manufacture or invent or innovate most of the drugs. I mean, the I'm talking about the essential medicines. So the, yes. the WHO list of 750. So now this actually what we are seeing that that innovation, especially uh, as well as uh, in some, as you were right, very right, that uh, university and or the hospitals, 
universities mm-hmm. they are mostly engaged in uh, invention this thing yes. so how much the market is influencing especially the ip intellectual property finance market and this is the financialization loop so i'm just thinking that whether this model could be further stretched so i mean coming to taking the point from uh, uh, dr homer's i mean idea just it could be further stretched and then we could predict okay so if they say, say this much of venture capital could come in and this much of capital is actually coming to say x or y organizations and then uh, the endogenous heterogeneity I, i'm just thinking that probably uh, it would have some exogenous factor also mm-hmm. the farm's capacity of course it's endogenous but the drivers are actually uh, at times exogenous i'm just giving you the i mean systems analysis and then the dynamics i'm coming up coming into this so have that's you con- right. how much you have interacted with this that's why but it's yes, really I, very interesting work thank you so much thank you thank you very much uh, for the for the interesting um um angle that uh, that you chose to talk about too uh, yes that that financial aspect is is a big driver of of these um um innovation strategies i would say and uh, i agree that there are actual dynamic mechanisms in there as you just talked about i haven't looked at it by any means so i think my my approach towards this has been you know step by step growing into this model so what you see oh. here is just dealing getting a hang of data dealing with it and then and then finding the the attributions i can find in the data and then my next step will be a stylized uh, system dynamics model and then a, a a little bit expanded model to deal with data and there will be maybe w- where i will start adding that kind of dynamics if i ever get there i think that will be like in 10 years with the with the <laughs> speed at which research happens you know which is a well, lot that less is what i, I think but jack homer also was coming at yeah so yeah. that you <laughs> all we we all want you to <laughs> continue this work even in harvard and other spaces <laughs> <laughs> yeah that remains to mj i think as my supervisor but yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you the thing that that occurred to me was that uh you you, you noted the parallel between your structure and hajir's structure which was for firms in general and and that wonderful work that he did um mm-hmm. went in many different directions you know it, it started from that simple structure and then and then he asks questions about um conditions competitive conditions and other conditions that could that could change the dynamics so uh, i'm not sure he got into heterogeneity exactly and anyway the, where i'm leading with this is that yes maybe in it'll take 5 or 10 years but you should work with hajir i think you should i think that's what you should do <laughs> thank you he's he's actually a member of my phd committee and i've i've benefited from his his uh, you know feedback a lot so yeah mm-hmm. I I wanted to say one final thing too. I wanted to uh, kind of take it and put the different spin on Douglas's comment that we often as when we, we get into this we do most of our work in a quantitative mode of thinking. We don't do quite enough of the qualitative work. And I think learning that balance and timing of that yin and yang of qualitative and quantitative it's a challenge for us especially yes. if our if our strengths seem to lie more on the quant side then we overlook and don't take full advantage of the quantitative learning that can qualitative learning that can take place by talking to other researchers and taking that just sort of inquiry type well what do you think's going on so anyway i just wanted to reemphasize what douglas said and leave that thought with all of us really it's a reminder for myself as well well thank you and that was that was very on point i think as it's obvious i have come towards this research from the theoretical aspect you know the operational dynamic capability the the theoretical organizational modeling aspect and yes i i definitely lack the the uh, expertise and and insights in that but i i appreciate the fact that that is needed and hopefully maybe I, in future i can acquire that skill or find a good co-author to do that thanks for that that's that's, that's very interesting but I, I i'm i'm not often described as qualitative so that that's uh, uh, i'll 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 tell eric wilson on that uh, um but uh, i i think i'm uh, i i, I I suppose I think more iteratively. So, 
So we have conversations with the people who own our problems and, and we try to turn these conversations into models using whatever data we can get. You've got loads. Uh, um, so it, so it, it, it's, it, it's qualitative and, and quantitative, but it, it goes around in circles. And, 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 but also, uh, clearly, they would surely be interested to meet you because you've, you've looked into uh, aspects of the data, but also aspects of the structure that might bring... Um, that, that, that might be a, an aha moment for them to say, "Oh, I'd never really thought about what we're doing in that in these terms." But in fact, that that's the, you know there there are insights that they would get from it. So, um, and uh, clearly, from the way you're describing it, you're you're only just beginning, and you've got a new phase ahead of you. So, we'll hear more about this, as Jack said. Thank you. Thank you. Point four three. Thank you. I didn't have the chance to to look into the chat. I don't know if there was any question that went unanswered there, but um, maybe I missed a couple. Um, I, this is a question for Wayne. Will I will I have access to a recording or the the the, the chats? Um, right now? I think you're muted, Wayne. You can go to chat right now and just download it. Just go to the chat. There's a button at the bottom of the chat window that says, make a copy of the, save my chat for me. Yes, uh, that's what I'm doing. Go ahead and just do that. It'll grab that stuff yeah. and put in a little text file. You'll be prompted when you when you go out to, to save that or print it or whatever you want to do. Okay. Let me stop sharing too. And um, thank you. Thank you for this chance. I, I hope, uh, I, I've been telling Wayne that this is a really good venue for us PhD students to present and require feedback. I hope some other students will follow. I, I yeah. think I sort of initiated this. So yeah. I'll push we, others in our lab. And our, all of us who are advising people need to continue to think about who, should, you know, who can we ask, and, and we'll do that. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the recording now.